Thank you for joining us today for the City Church Online Experience. If this ministry has blessed you in any way, please consider partnering with us in our mission to change our city by spreading the gospel. You can do so safely and securely by giving online through the app or by texting any amount to the number 84321. I want you to remember that God, God's created everything you see. He breathed it into existence. You remember when his people were caught up in slavery? He rescued them. What he did was he parted the sea and he made a way for them. And then he delivered their enemies to them and he unlocks wounds and he provides water from a rock and he provides manna from heaven and he brought down the walls of Jericho. He froze the sun, allowing victory. He's toppled giants with tiny stones. He's brought fire from heaven. He shut the mouths of lions. He preserved life in the belly of a well. He's fed thousands with a few loaves. He gives the weak strength. He heals the sick. He's made the the blind see, the deaf ear, the mute speak, the lame walk, and he's overcome evil, and he's made a way through death for you and me by the death and the resurrection of the Son, Jesus Christ, that we will live with him forever. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. What are we afraid of? His resume is flawless. Well, I am excited about this, uh, this series, Go Big or Go Home, a series about radical faith. How many of you know God wants to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think in our own lives? Hello. Some of you don't act like, uh, like you believe it, but it's in God's word and it's, it's true. And so uh, through this series, I want to I challenge you uh, to believe big, to dream big, to expect big. Uh, and I want to look in the life this morning of Peter because Peter was one of those types of guys that either he hit a home run or he struck out. Like he went big or he, uh, he went home. He experienced uh, major highs and, you know, and some, some major lows. And so at the end of the day, uh, God wants us to, to believe for big things. And as we get the word working on the inside of us, uh, it, it builds us faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hello, are you with me this morning? And so if you got little word, you got little faith, no matter what you think or what you say. You can say, I got big faith, but if you have no word, you, don't have, you, you have little faith. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so through this series, uh, I just want to challenge you to, uh, to, to look at God's word, to uh, believe God for, for big things. Amen. Hey, if there's a yes in your heart, God can do more than you imagine. Come on. Who's going to help me preach? I'm going to preach to this side right here because I'm feeling all the love this morning over here. Amen. Amen. All right. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. When you're ready, say, I'm ready, pastor. All right. Hopefully, they'll have it on the, the screen. All right. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two, somebody say two, two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowd from there. When he had finished speaking, he said, To Simon, now go out to where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we've worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. (laughs) Have you ever told God why his way won't work? (laughs) Come on, you know what I'm talking about? Nah, I've already done that, Lord. And so uh, what Simon Peter says next, five words that could greatly impact your life and impacted Peter's life, and those words are, but if you say so. Come on, that, those words there can change your whole entire life. Like, I, I, I've tried that, but the nevertheless at your word, if you say so, uh, changed Peter's life, and it can change your life. 
as well. And he goes, I'll let the nets down again. And at this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. And a shout for help brought their partners in the other boats. And as soon as both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, what had, tell your neighbor what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh, Lord, please leave me. I am such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the son of Zebedee, were also amazed. And Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything to follow Jesus. Touch your neighbor and say, Neighbor, you are built for beyond the boat. You're built for beyond the boat. Uh, Peter and Jesus have this encounter, and Jesus is going to lead Peter on a process to live beyond what he knows. And you and I, he, he wants to lead us on the same process to get us beyond our comfort zone, beyond our boat, to make an impact, to make a difference. And so he, he wants you to live beyond your understanding, live beyond, beyond what you're comfortable with, what you, what you uh, are familiar with. And so the first thing Jesus does is he notices uh, empty boats. He, he notices, I think he takes personal like this unused potential. Like every one of us has things that have been deposited on the inside of us. Like you're a 10 in something. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm a 10. Say, I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but I know I'm a 10 in something. God has placed gifts, talents, and abilities on the inside of you. And I think he finds it personal. Like this untapped, unused potential. Because the potential of a boat will never be discovered as long as it's on the shore. And a lot of us don't move out into what God has called us to, not because there's no potential, because there's an unwillingness to get off the shores of life and push out into something maybe that is unfamiliar. And so we see Jesus taking attention to empty boats and empty vessels and leads me to my, to my first point that Jesus does with our boat slash life is he finds it. And so when, when Jesus steps into Peter's boat, he's stepping into more than just a boat. He's stepping into Peter's business. Oh, come on, somebody. You ever had somebody go, get up all, all up in your business? See, the boat isn't just a boat. It's a, it's a lifestyle. It's a, a way that Peter made his living. It's, it, it represents his history and represents his present and his future. It's like You know, Peter didn't go to a job fair and say, you know what, I cast net really well. I think I'll be a fisherman. No, he was was born, fishing chose him. He didn't choose fishing. His grandpappy, his grandpappy pappy was probably a fisherman just as as well as Jesus as, you know, um, Joseph, which was actually his, you know, stepfather was a carpenter. And so that's what Jesus did. And so you, you just didn't go to you to your local university and decide to be what you want. No, you were, you were born into that. And so when Jesus steps into to Peter's boat, he's stepping all up in his, in his business, in his livelihood, in his past, his history, his, his present, his, his future. And, and, and so uh, we can look at it as just a boat, but it's, it's more than a boat. It's more than just stepping in this this vessel. It's, it's about Jesus stepping in our lifestyle. It's, you know, and, and the reality is, is this is not the first time that Peter and Jesus have met. Many of you have this picture of the fact that Peter's been fishing, now he's washing nets, and this stranger comes up named Jesus and is like, hey, I'm going to get in your boat and you do this and do that and then follow me. Like there's no historical record of, of Peter and, and Jesus ever meeting, but that's not true. See, we look in Luke chapter 4, and we can discover that Peter knew who Jesus was. As a matter of fact, in Luke 4, 38, it says, Jesus went to Simon, somebody help me out, home. Like, he's been to Peter's house. And so he, he goes, and he, he finds Peter's mother-in-law that was very sick with a high fever, and he, 
And he says, please heal her for everyone begged. And so at the end of the day, Peter is familiar with Jesus and his ability. Otherwise, why would they implore him to heal her? And so it's one thing, listen to me. It's one thing to be familiar with Jesus. It's a whole nother thing to follow Jesus. Come on, it's one thing for Jesus to come to your house. Can I preach a little bit? It's one thing for Jesus to come to your house. It's a whole nother thing for Jesus to step all up in your boat. To step all up in your business, to step up in your livelihood, to step up in your money, in your relationships, and in your marriage. It's one thing to do a, a Sunday, Jesus. Jesus, you come to my house, but it's a whole nother level when you step into somebody's business. See, a lot of us like to be familiar with Jesus because we're in the South. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know, and see, you can be around Jesus and not be bought into who he is. You can, you can experience the power operating around you, right? Because the mother-in-law was healed, but not actually operating in the power that is available in your life. And so at Luke chapter 4, verses 38, we see a Peter that is familiar with Jesus, but not yet following Jesus. And so at this point, the relationship's only one way. It's only, Jesus, will you help me? Hallelujah. Y'all don't do nothing like that, right? Y'all don't just come to church when you need something from God. Hallelujah. See, the relationship is all about asking. Will you do this? Will you do that? Will you help me here? Will you? It's just one-sided. It's all take, 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 take in Luke chapter 4. See, when you, when you allow Jesus in your house, you ain't moved from, from asking Jesus to answer. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing to answer in Jesus. Because there's a Luke chapter 5 that's coming and, and there's a Jesus that's going to ask, can I use your boat? Y'all ain't ready. I ain't feeling no love today. I ain't feeling no love. And so we like, we like Jesus coming to my house and meeting my needs. You know, it's like having that one friend. You know, that one friend that all, when you see him call, you know he needs something. You're like, oh, Lord, it's a good thing God don't look at us like you look at that person when they calls. You know what I'm saying? I'm just going to throw that out there. There's nothing wrong with God meeting your needs. And he does, and he delights in it. But can I say this, that any healthy relationship is going to be about give and take. If you, if you try to make a withdrawal in a relationship where you hadn't made a deposit, you're going to bankrupt the account. That's, that's the problem with a lot of us is that we're bankrupt in the relationship account because we hadn't invested because we take, 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 and you hadn't made an investment. You hadn't made a deposit, and so our, our marriages can get to the place to where they're bankrupt because it's all, it's all one-sided. And we see in Luke chapter 4 that Peter, Peter is, he's just asking, like, can you, can you do this for me of course Jesus is like yeah but Peter's not following he's he's just familiar he's never extended his relationship has not gone any further than from asking to answering when I let Jesus up in my boat, I let him up in my business. I let him up in what I'm watching on TV. I, I let him up on what I'm listening to. I let him, I let him, when I let him in my boat, I let him into those websites that I click. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing. Those websites. And so are, are we letting him, are we letting him in our boat? Or are we just comfortable with him coming to our house? Are we actually answering Jesus or in our relationship with God? We just come to church when we need something and we just ask, 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 ask. It's tough, isn't it? Go big or go, come on, help me out. So we see the relationship up to this point. That Peter has got to push beyond his convenience. Come on, answering Jesus is not going to stroke your comfort and fulfill your calling at the same time. Come on, some of you got to understand that we're so addicted to comfort that we sacrifice the calling of God upon our life in attempts to embrace comfort. We, we kill the calling. And so it wasn't convenient for Peter to, 
to launch back out. It wasn't convenient. There was nothing, there's nothing convenient about mobile church. It's nothing convenient about those lights I install every morning. I love it. They look good. I'm the light guy. I bring the light. Come on, somebody. But it's not convenient. But I value my calling over my comfort because I know if, if I let my flesh call the shots, I'll always stay in my comfort zone and I'll, always, I'll, never, I'll never let God use, he'll never, I'll never let him in my boat, in my business. Why? Because it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable when God shows me things that I need to stop doing and attitudes I need to correct and mindsets that I need to, you know, to crucify and strongholds that need to be, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to get up here and preach every week to you. I know I make it look easy, but it's not. It's uncomfortable. I'm nervous every time. Don't tell anybody that. It's just our secret. I'm like, oh, God, please help me. It's not comfortable. But I've got to, go, I've got to push beyond my comfort and my inconvenience to fulfill and walk out the calling of God that's upon my life. It's never going to be convenient. Never. And so Peter had to push the boat out. Somebody say, push it. I mean, you know, pushing it takes effort and energy. I was going to bust a, a salt and pepper reference, but I'd be kind of awkward. Nah. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Come on, some of, you, some of you are blushing right now. I don't have time to tell you about my Waffle House trip on a, on, on a Saturday morning. And that was blaring. It's like I had all my grandparents that were in there, and that was playing. But there's effort and energy and strength that, that it takes to, to push out the boat. You got to be willing to be inconvenienced. You got to be willing to, to be that person that says, God, send me. I know it's not going to be comfortable, I know it's going to be challenging. But I'll be willing to do it. And so God leads us in steps. He says, Peter, push me out. But that's not really what Jesus wants from Peter. It isn't to, to be pushed out. It's, a, it's about establishing trust in the relationship. And can you be faithful with the push? Can he trust you with more? Because many of us don't pass the push test. We step in and he steps in our boat and he's like, push me out. And you're like, no, it ain't going to work, Jesus. That ain't going to happen. It's so comfortable over here washing my nets and let me just do me. How about I just do me and you do you? And, 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 and many of us, we don't pass the push test. But the push is not the point. It's a greater point. The push is a part of the process. It's a part of the step. If you can't be faithful in the push, you'll never enjoy the nets being filled. And many of us, because we will not get out of our comfort zone, we're addicted to comfort. We don't want to be inconvenienced by the push, but yet we pray to God to fill our nets. And he's saying, push. And you're saying, nah, I'm comfortable. I don't like getting up early. I don't like renewing my mind. I don't like none of it. I just want it to rain dollar bills in my life, Lord. Pipe dream, fairy tale. He's saying, push to us, push. Can you push me out? Because what you're praying for, I'll bring to you alive. But can, you, can I trust you in the push so, I can, so, so that you would be prepared for the increase? If you can't steward the push, then you'll never be in a place to gather the fish. Oh, he, he, he finds our, our boat. He finds it so that he can use it in such a way that would bring him honor and glory. But if we're not willing to, to get out beyond the push, we never enjoy and experience where it's deep. Come on, some of you want to go so deep, but yet you won't put. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing. God, take me deeper. He's going to push. You got you to push off the shore. Can you steward the push in life? Can you, can you get yourself in position to handle the increase? And so in verse 4, he tells Simon, go out where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Now, this sounds awesome if you're a fisherman like Peter. 
But the problem is Peter is the expert fisherman and Jesus is the carpenter. It's like, bro, stay in your lane. I've done tried that. I've done did that. I've done, we've been out here all night. You build chairs, I catch fish. Let me do me and you just do you. Like, Jesus, I I got this. And so many people have this mindset, I got this. Like, I got this. I know how to do relationships. What do you mean I'm not to have premarital sex? Oh, y'all ain't say, let me come over here. They looking at me mean mugging on this side. What, what, do you, what do you mean abstinent? That's for like first century. What do you, what do you mean like manage your money like the word, word says? That's not, that's not, let me do me, Jesus. Let me, you do you, Jesus, and I'll do me. But the reality is, how's that working for you? How, how's it working for you? Many of us are saying, Jesus, let me do me. But how's your nets? A lot of us are saying, I'll do me, and you, 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 God, you just do you, but we got empty nets. And so we can spend so much time, effort, energy, trying to convince God why his way won't work. Meanwhile, we just suffer with empty nets. And so the first step in filling your net is admitting that it's empty, Some of you, that's why we medicate, and that's why we escape from reality, and that's why we we indulge in in alcohol to numb the empty nets in life. You got an empty net, just admit it. There needs to be a, if you say so, Lord, on the inside. There needs to be a yes on the inside of you. Because many of us struggle with our nets being empty. And the first step in letting God fill them is at least admitting it's empty. And we try to put on a fake facade. Peter hadn't caught anything all night, right? I've been toiling all night and I hadn't caught anything. Well, Proverbs tells us in chapter 14 that there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death. The end thereof is empty nets that you can spend so much time pursuing and chasing things in this world. And at the end of my way and the end of me doing things, I've got to acknowledge my nets are empty. At some point in our relationship, Jesus will ask you to go beyond your understanding. Like Jesus, I tried that. Well, maybe it's not what you're doing. It's when you're doing it. Maybe it's not doing something different. It's just the timing was just off. But faith is stepping beyond what you understand and trusting God. If he says, push, then I push him out. If he says, go deeper, I go go deeper. If he says, let down my nets, it doesn't matter if I've been letting down my nets all night. I've got to acknowledge my way has not brought me to a place of fulfillment or satisfaction. I'm looking at all the time, effort, and energy, and I'm just, I got empty nets. Can you admit that you, you got empty nets? Can this, on the inside of you, if you say so, Lord, Like everything in me says, this is not going to work. This is not how any of this is supposed to work. I am the expert. Can you push beyond that and say, Lord, if you say so, I will. Many of us don't get to that place in life. But Peter obeys Jesus. It's in that obedience. Then his nets are so full that he has to call others over to help him with the catch. A yes, listen to me, watch this. A yes to Jesus don't just impact your life, it impacts the others because he called James and John around and it filled their boat. I wonder whose boat is empty because you keep telling God no. If a yes can fill it, then a no can drown. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing. Oh, look, if you you say so, I know that I'm the expert, but I'm willing to... Admit, maybe I don't know everything, and maybe you got a little something. I've seen you heal my mother-in-law. Wasn't too happy about that. I mean, that's... 
I love my mother-in-law, but... So he could have been a little aggravated about that, like, shoot, man, dog. But maybe I don't know everything, and maybe, maybe I can admit my nets are, are empty. And, and when my obedience, stepping into what God says for my life, watch this. He finds our boat, then he fills our boat. You never experience a full boat without obedience to God's word. You'll, you'll never experience it. And so he fills our boats. Now the thing that has been empty for Peter is now, it's now it's filled. And we can in life begin to cast our nets everywhere. Right? I'm, I'm going to catch me a man. I'm going to catch me that girl right there. Woo, she fine. Get in this boat, girl. Catch, catch money. You got, you got to, if you want to know how to really catch, you got to put the anchor in your mouth. Come on, where are my fishermen at? Come on, just so y'all know. Just, that thing opens up. Spend your whole life trying to catch the American dream and finances and relationships and marriage and vacation and just throwing our nets, throwing our nets, throwing our nets. Look like the sprinkler, throwing our nets, throwing our nets, throwing our nets everywhere and our, our nets empty. And it'll always be empty as long as you're disobedient to go deeper. Let down your net. As long as you're disobedient, it will leave your boat empty and others empty as well. See, God isn't going to fill your boat just all for you, silly. It's for other people too. And so he, he fills it. Now watch this. Now the thing that... Peter has been chasing his whole entire life. It's safe to say that Peter on that day filled his boat so full of fish and it filled the other boats. I would dare to say, now I don't have any biblical reference to this, but I'd be willing to bet that he caught more fish that day than any of than his grandfather's grandfather's grandfather. I don't know that to be a fact, but I would be willing to bet that that haul on that day was more fish than anyone in Peter's family, his great-great-grandfather, have ever caught. Now watch what Peter's obedience to Jesus and his word, watch what happens. This is how the blessing of the Lord works. Peter spent his whole entire life chasing fish. Now the thing that was running away from him is chasing him down to get in his boat. That, that Peter, in one moment of listening to Jesus, accomplished in one day what didn't happen for generation after generation after generation. Now the thing that was fleeing and running from his nets are running to the boat to get in his boat. That's the blessing of the Lord. Goodness and mercy follows me all the days of my life. I'm blessed wherever I put my foot or place my hand. I've been given every spiritual blessing. Come on, somebody. I've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. And we spend so much time, effort, and energy casting our nets, casting our nets, casting our nets. Could it be if we just seek the king and his kingdom and his righteousness first all these fish will jump in our boats come on somebody spend all this time maybe they're over here maybe she's at this bar maybe the, he's at that club come on maybe he's over here or she's over there maybe this job will make me happy maybe that job over here will make me happy maybe maybe if i try this substance it'll make me happy and the whole time jesus is saying if you do it my way i'll bring all those things that you're chasing to your boat to your boat somebody say the boat god the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he's the captain of my boat Listen to verse 8. I got I to hurry up. Worship team ate up all my time again. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I know. We got to have a talk about that. 
Verse 8, when, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, somebody say, had happened, he fell to his knees. Team, you can help me out. Before Jesus and said, oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others. When you realize that God did and can do for you in a moment what you could never do for yourself in a, in a lifetime, you can't help but to worship him. You know, sometimes people find God like I did, like at the bottom of my barrel. Like, you know, you have no place to look but up, like broken and all. But some people, they, they find Jesus after they get everything they wanted. Right? It's not my testimony. But a lot of times... You know, some people that can be successful, like King Solomon, he can look around and say, I've accomplished all this stuff, and it's all, it's all vanity. Peter had been chasing fish his whole entire life. He's a fisherman, man. He's been looking for a haul like this. He, he, you know, he, he just dreamt of experiencing possibly the, the payday at the market. I mean, it was, you know, his business. This was absolutely a, amazing. But when Jesus leads us on steps, it, it wasn't just to, to push him out. It wasn't just to fill, fill his nets, but it was also to show him something about his boat, to show him something about his life. And, and now, and now Peter is starting to understand and he's starting to, to kind of realize what's going on here with this, this person called Jesus, this Messiah. He's starting to recognize that although my boat may be filled with fish, it ain't fish that fill my boat. The fish don't fill my boat. And so Jesus is leading Peter on this process of faith. Will you push it? Will you cast it? Will you go out deeper? And he finds empty vessels full of potential. And he fills it, not with fish, but with his presence. Peter understood, yeah, I got all these fish, but fish are not what fills my boat. My boat was filled the moment Jesus stepped in it. And so many of us spend our whole entire life and we never figure that out. I mean, he took the biggest catch of his life and he brought it to the shore. And what did he do? He left it. He left it. So he filled it. He filled his life. He filled his boat. He filled it and did for him in a moment to say, Peter, what you thought filled your boat is not what fills your boat. Because the third thing that Jesus does with our life, with our boat, is that he flips it. He finds it, he fills it, and he flips it because he wants to take what's inside of it and make it available to everyone. And Peter learned that it wasn't about what I could get, it's about what I could give. Why do I need all these fish when I can follow the one that created them? Why do I need all these fish when I can serve the one that can take two? He can take two and feed thousands. Why does he even need my boat? He's the God that walks out on the water. Maybe he's wanting to show you something. What fills your boat? Come on, you were built to live beyond the boat. And Jesus said, Peter, I'm about to flip everything you think you know upside down. See, you thought you would be a fisherman. You thought that you would be around these, the Sea of Galilee and these waters forever. But no, I'm going to call you to do something that you probably ain't never done before. I'm going to call you to shepherd people, to catch people. Peter, I'm going to flip everything you think you know upside down. That the first shall be last and the last shall be first. If you, if you want to save your life, you'll lose it. But those that lose their life will find it. I'm going to teach you how to bless those who spitefully use you. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm about to flip everything you know on its head. I'm going to show you what fills your boat. And isn't it ironic that he finds it, fills it, and he flips it. And Peter's death, he died on the cross. But it was upside down. Oh, he, he flips it. 
I don't know what you think fills your boat, but let me tell you something. When Jesus steps in it, it's as full as it can be. And those things that you've been chasing, that effort, that time, that energy, all that you struggling and striving, Jesus say, be still and know that I am God. I am the one who makes a way. Hallelujah. Oh, that's the guy I want to follow. That's the God I want to follow. That's my king. He don't need our boat. He can walk right out of the water. He don't need our fish. He can just take two and feed thousands. Oh, will you let him find it? Will you let him fill it? Will you let him flip it? Would you stand all over this room? Come on, can we put our hands together for Jesus in this moment?